It can be difficult to find non-displaced temporal bone fractures, but just as important as finding the subtle fracture is not overcalling. You don't want to incorrectly call a normal structure a fracture. This lecture is going to go over the normal structures that people will sometimes mistakenly call a temporal bone fracture. We'll start with a discussion of canals and aqueducts, and this is just a list of all the different things we're about to talk about. My favorite thing not to call a fracture is the subarcuate canal. It's called subarcuate because it goes underneath the arch of the superior semicircular canal. Here is the anterior limb and here is the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. We're way up high in the petrous apex. And here is the subarcuate canal. It carries the subarcuate artery, which is going to supply the middle ear cavity. Uh, in Europe, this is called the petromastoid canal. That's a synonym for the subarcuate canal. This very straight, very fracture-looking object is called the innominate canal. It carries the singular nerve between the internal auditory canal and the vestibule. Uh, this may also be called the singular canal because it carries the singular nerve, and frankly, innominate canal is a lousy name. Here's another very straight object. This one is running from the jugular bulb out to the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. We're about one centimeter above the stylomastoid foramen on this axial cut. This is the mastoid canaliculus. It carries Arnold's nerve. The inferior tympanic canaliculus you usually can't see at all, so I'm sh intentionally showing you an example where the ITC is enlarged. The reason it's enlarged here is that it normally carries the inferior tympanic artery and the inferior tympanic nerve, which are alternately called Jacobson's artery and Jacobson's nerve, uh, and it's carrying it up into the middle ear cavity. It becomes enlarged in situations like this where there is an aberrant internal carotid artery, and the flow is carried not through the carotid foramen, but rather through the inferior tympanic canaliculus as an enlargement of the inferior tympanic artery. Normally, this one you can't even see, so it's not usually confused with a fracture. This is the facial hiatus. Just to orient you, here is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. You don't want to confuse that with a fracture either. This is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, and that makes this the geniculate ganglion. Now, sometimes the geniculate ganglion sits all the way along the anterior aspect of the petrous apex, and sometimes it's a little bit tucked in. And so you need a canal for the greater superficial petrosal nerve to extend from the geniculate ganglion out into the middle cranial fossa. And and that canal is the facial hiatus. It carries the greater superficial petrosal nerve when such a canal is necessary. Everyone's familiar with the vestibular aqueduct. This is uh, just to show you where it is normally on an axial image. If you're having trouble seeing it on an axial image, it's better depicted on a sagittal image like here. If you do an oblique reconstruction, you can really lay it out beautifully and show how its uh, posterior end flares out. Um, but usually you can tell just from the axial images if there's anything abnormal about the vestibular aqueduct. You may have heard of the vestibular aqueduct, but have you heard of the cochlear aqueduct? There is another aqueduct that helps to recycle the perilymph and endolymph back into the CSF, and this one's the cochlear aqueduct. It lies parallel to the internal auditory canal, but substantially more inferior, and you can see it here running from the lateral medullary cistern towards the round window. That's the normal cochlear aperture, and it can be confused with a fracture because it's very straight. The other major category of things that can be confused with fractures are sutures and fissures. Again, just a list of the sutures and fissures we're going to talk about. It does seem like I've randomly selected anatomic terms and paired them up, and uh, it is kind of like that. <laughs> 
The sphenooccipital synchondrosis occurs between the basisphenoid bone and the basiaccipital bone, and it marks the very center of the clivus. Now, this synchondrosis completely fuses when people are in their early teens, and so uh, adults no longer have this sphenooccipital synchondrosis. You'll see this in children exclusively, and you don't want to mistake it for a transverse-oriented fracture. It's usually easier to analyze this particular synchondrosis when you see it in the sagittal plane. And here's its typical sagittal appearance dividing the clivus in half. Next is the sphenosquamosal suture. This runs medial to the temporal mandibular joint from the medial aspect of the joint forward into the infratemporal fossa. Next is the occipital mastoid suture. And this one's a little tricky because you, it looks like you're just you're fracturing off a tiny little bit of bone here, but this is part of the occipital bone and this is part of the temporal bone, the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, and this is a normal structure. It extends back here, again, the occipital mastoid uh, suture a little more posteriorly. You can see how that would be easily mistaken for an occipital fracture. This continues on afterwards and becomes the familiar lambdoid suture and extends all the way up the occipital bone uh, to uh, join its counterpart and become the sagittal suture. Our next is the petrooccipital suture that lies along the lateral aspect of the inferior clivus. Then the petrosquamosal suture. I had to find a patient with osteopetrosis to show a good example of this, um, but this runs from the middle ear cavity up to the middle cranial fossa. It's usually difficult to appreciate, but it can, if it gets enlarged, look like a gap in the tegmen. Here's the tympanomastoid suture that runs posterior and parallel to the external auditory canal. Here's the tympanosquamous suture. This one's hard to find, um, and it is running behind the temporomandibular joint, but in front of the external auditory canal. The sphenopetrosal suture runs posterior to the foramen ovale and lateral to the eustachian tube. Because this is running along the course of other major anatomic structures like the eustachian tube and the petrous segment of the internal carotid artery, it is frequently mistaken for a fracture. With a crowd favorite, the petroclival synchondrosis. This is just lateral to the upper clivus, and it's famous as the origin of clival chondrosarcomas. So I've gone through a big long list of potential anatomic structures that can be confused with fractures. Which ones have I actually seen confused with fractures and read out incorrectly? The subarcuate canal is my favorite for a reason that's frequently mistaken. The anominate canal or singular canal, it's in a position that is very confusing if you don't know what to look for it. The cochlear aqueduct also in a very confusing um, position and the occipital mastoid suture. It's a common location for fractures, so everyone's looking in that location. So I, I would say these are the ones you should be most careful of not to call a fracture when you're evaluating a patient who's undergone trauma.